Hello, my name is John Rayson. Welcome to the Santa Fe Relocation Redefine webinar. Um, we have a lot to get through today. Um, we're going to start with a little video and then we'll explain what we're going to talk about. So the Global Mobility Report is now live. Um, we've spent the last six months preparing it, and it really follows on from previous years looking at transformation, talent and risk. The benefit today, we believe for you um, listening into this webinar is to really start to reflect about how mobility will change within your organizations over the next year, next two or three years. We now are um, in a situation where the pandemic uh, we've been through the first phase, there are now still mutations coming through and um, what we're going to talk about today is really the implications for the mobility teams and the implications for organisations in terms of deploying people. I'm joined here today by um, my colleagues who either edited or contributed to the report. I'd like to welcome Peter Graham. Hello Peter. Hi, good morning John, good morning everybody. Peter, Peter leads our immigration um, and visa organisation. Dino Yangra. Hello, everybody. Dino is the global practice leader for Crow, a worldwide tax organization. Julia. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. Julia is our chief operating officer managing our relocation organization, which covers assignment management, um, immigration, um, and destination services. So welcome, Julia. Me, I'm the head of consulting. Um, this is the 10th year I've been doing this, so um, it feels a bit like a sort of a deja vu for me. And last but not least, I'd like to uh, welcome Selena Jones-May. Good morning, Selena. Morning, everybody. Selena was, um, was one of our uh, clients and has now, is now collaborating with us and has her own uh, consultancy in mobility and benefits. So rather than leaping right into the webinar, what I want to do really is for you just to be thinking about, you know, how has the pandemic reshaped your organization landscape? What's changing? You know, some sectors are doing really, really well. Some sectors are having to transform. What does this mean for mobility? And mobility, as we'll find out from Dino in a minute, is no longer what we thought it was. What does this mean in terms of opportunities for the organization and also for the mobility profession? What are the challenges to get there? Also want to talk a bit about ESG and, and again, we'll get, go into what that really means uh, as we go through. And last but not least, what is it that we need to be doing differently, us within, within, the, organiz within the profession supporting organizations? How, how do we need to be partnering differently? So without further ado, let's focus on transformation. Dino, can I ask you to just walk us through how this came about from, a, from an idea we had back in June? Sure, um, the, the context here is we're looking at the workload. So the workload of people who work in international HR and global mobility, or those in an organization who are, who are assisting those um, um, uh, important people that deal with this issue. So on the left hand side, we have what we used to do in 2019. So we were dealing with structured uh, mobility. We were dealing with people on formalized programs, um, business travelers. Um, we were talking uh, about people on long term assignments, short term assignments commuters and and that's what we're used to and that's what was happening um before the pandemic uh, started and I, I guess what's happened um over the last what feels like almost almost two years now is um the workload has changed it's more complex um uh, there has been an explosion in a new type of mobility so cross-border remote workers uh, um, through necessity um, um, have been um, exploding in, in our domestic workforce. So, so what we've seen is, is global mobility compliance as a challenge and as an issue entering our workforce that before the pandemic 
was not globally mobile. Uh, what this meant, what this, what this means is, for those that work in international HR, global mobility, the workload now includes the people in 2019, uh, and that's all coming back, as well as this new unstructured form of mobility that's happening across uh, almost the entire workforce. Um, those are my quick thoughts, John. Thank you. So, so clearly, the 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 mobility is no longer just mobility; it covers a very much bigger spectrum. Absolutely. So following on with that, Dino, let's just think about some of the things that really have happened. T tell us about mobility and visibility in the last year. So in terms of the pandemic, I mean, it really has put a spotlight on, you know, mobility. So we've had that visibility develop. So you can see there in the statistics that it says almost a third, so 29% now of functions, you know, are now visible due to the pandemic. So I think, you know, it gives us a really great opportunity to get our business cases all dusted off and approved and um, the business, you know, know who we are. And I think, you know, we've really demonstrated our value. So we just need to continue because obviously this pandemic, as you said, John, is continuing to rattle on and um, shows no sign of ceasing anytime soon. So, you know, we are the forefront and we should really maintain that trajectory, um, given that we're now looking at a global workforce rather than just a mobile population. Julia, any other comments? Yeah, well, I think um, you know, what this um, set of statistics shows as well is the fact that um, global mobility has, although it's always been striving to, has actually become much more visible within um, the business. So more and more business leaders are aware of global mobility, which is what mobility has wished for. Um, but with that comes expectation. So global mobility is going to have to um, make sure that they've, they're shored up with the right support um, to support them with perhaps with some of the more transactional activities so that they can deliver on the expectations that, um, that business is expecting of them. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that as we go through the session today. But mobility is now visible and needs to be more proactive than reactive and, and take on this additional scope that Dino and um, Selena were discussing just before. Thank you. And, and I guess, Julia, you're part of a leadership team that, you know, the, the leadership are, are inquisitive and they ask questions. So I guess the challenge and opportunity for mobility is that as leadership start to know more about mobility and what it really, really can do for the organisation, so more, more questions will come out. Exactly, yes. So, um, again, if I can ask Julia to you to kick off on this then please you know what's 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 happening to the roles of mobility and and, and just to give a quick context so in the survey we asked over 50 business leaders and we asked mobility what is it you know where should you be spending your time during the day working that that's the context yeah so here I think we're we're looking at where as you say where global mobility should be spending most of their time and this what business leaders think uh, versus what global mobility professionals think um, and quite interestingly I think um, both business leaders and global mobility professionals see um, the value that global mobility can bring to talent deployment so that strategic workforce planning with a third of business and GM professionals thinking that that's where they can add value. Um, given that 58% of business leaders didn't actually have visibility of global mobility prior to the pandemic, it suggests that perhaps there was an underlying assumption that that was a global mobility role, that global mobility was acting like a sort of HR business partner, whereas in, um, in fact, most cases, that wasn't necessarily the case. Global mobility has been quite transactional. So this is you know, the evolution that we're going to see for the role global mobility is going to be expected to play. Um, and in, in order to do that, as you say, John, um, business leaders are going to want to have information. If they're relying on mobility as a business partner, mobility is going to need to have data, dashboards, um, information on what will be a successful profile of a candidate um, for different locations, et cetera. So um, actually being actively involved in that workforce planning, um, whilst also on the right hand side of the screen, managing the compliance act aspects of mobility so it's um that that scale is tipping um and and mobility is going to need to have structures to support that thank you uh, selena you you've done this as a day job mm -hmm. what's your reaction to this yeah it's kind of fascinating to me i'm still you know julius 
spot on there that, you know, the strategic workforce, it seems to be a meeting of the minds between both parties about what's expected. But if you look at the rest of it, there's still like a feeling from Global Mobility that they need to be more, um, well, first of all, more advisory. The business don't see that. So I'm questioning that because I'm thinking, well, it's a pandemic, you know, everything we've been doing is really advisory to help the business steer through this, you know, storm. And then, you know, also I think the mobility professionals are overwhelmed. You know, you can see there all the administration from supplier management through to compensation calculations. So I guess we're still screaming out for that technology solution. And that's why a lot of organizations are steering down that, that way. Um, so I think there's more to go in terms of actually mobility professionals and the business leaders meeting, discussing the priorities and actually understanding resourcing needs as well, because I, I see there's obviously some gap there still between expectations on both sides. Absolutely. And I think I'm going to move on. So picking on what you said, Julia, leadership are very inquisitive and they run their businesses on data. What are some of the opportunities and challenges, do you think? Yeah, well, I guess um, the, this is quite an interesting um, set of statistics as well, because you can see that in 2021, across all of these um, metrics, there has been less reporting, less analytics that global mobility has been providing to business leaders. Um, whether that's because of pressures of actually managing through COVID and having other priorities, um, I think that's going to have to take a bit of a shift. Um, that top one, I know this is a favorite of yours, John, that um, you know, understanding total program costs that only just half in 2021 and, let, and just over half in 2020 of global mobility functions were providing total program costs is quite, quite alarming, I guess. I guess there's any other business area where you're spending quite significant amounts of money compared to you know, the, the spend per head of, of, of a global mobile employee compared to an, a regular employee is, is, as we all know, quite, quite significantly higher. To not actually know what the cost of that portion of your business is is, um, is something that I think business is going to start to really interrogate, particularly now that they have more visibility and understanding of the complexities of global mobility. So, um, so it, having a business that's running without actually understanding its costs, and, and it's not just the cost of the policy, it's the cost of the whole infrastructure, internal and external um, of that mobile program and um, attrition within the program and recruitment etc so it's um you know i think global mobility is going to need to step up to the plate and and get much more involved in that analytics um, the other piece is um just sort of having available um, data but not just for that analytics but also for um, just regular compliance and compliance is going to become more and more complex as we all know with um, you know, border restrictions, various um, you know, daily changing um, compliance so having that information readily available is, is going to be critical. And then doing that kind of analysis on um, on your talent profile. So if mobility is to be more involved in strategic workforce planning, do you actually have data at your fingertips to understand the profile of your overall organization, your um, your ED and I profile, and then also being able to report on um, ESG metrics as well. So analytics and data is going to become more and more at the forefront. I think, Dina, I think you might. Want to add to that? Yeah, just, just the only thought was what, which data, because um, with, with 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 everything we've been through, um, employee whereabouts, you know, where are they, and things like vaccination status, health status. So, so we're, we're starting to see a blur between what is probably public government health information and information that you as an employer need. And I think it's not entirely clear where where your role as an employer starts versus where it's it's the responsibility of government so interesting times ahead so in fact let's keep on with that then um in terms of you know the the trends of investing in technology i mean i can remember more than 10 years ago going to an event and hearing a, a corporate talk about their new system and it seemed very wonderful here we are 10 years 10 years on more than 10 years on selena Mm -hmm. and what's going on yeah so now i think there is like you can see a development between 2020 and 2021 in terms of a growing trend to invest in technology so clearly i think the pandemic has been a catalyst for 
um, technology business cases to be approved. Um, they're really looking at, you know, to Dino's point, the improvement in managing compliance, which is critical, particularly because authorities are also themselves automating. So there's more pressure and more expectation that organisations will too. That data analytics piece to to kind of connect to what Julia said about strategic workforce planning is critical during this um, time and it will continue that way. And then the experience, because we're hearing that a lot of, of individuals now don't really want to mobilise because they're frightened of maybe separate from their family or what's, what it's going to be like in the host. So that experience is really critical. So I think, um, you know, for organisations now, investing in technology is not a nice to have, it's a necessity. And um, if it, I think when we did the last webinar, we established for a poll that 25% of organisations had invested if they didn't already have one, but another 50% were in the middle of business cases and presenting to leadership. So, you know, there's definitely been a massive shift in this direction. Which is really pleasing to see. Thank you. So, Julia, from a from a provider, what what's your what's your take on this? Well, I think um, just touching on that employee experience is um, is important. So, you know, most of the world who um, certainly had desk jobs have had to change the way that they work and um, accessing and working remotely and um, and digitally. And I think organizations that, as well as investing in their own technology or technology from providers will have an expectation that their global mobility providers will have an enhanced digital experience for their employees. So um, for perhaps for not, not having to go and do a physical look-see trip, but being able to have a very interactive um, digital look-see experience. So more than just um, guidebooks and PowerPoints. So I think we're going to see a shift and um, an expectation from um, from clients on their providers to to be enhancing their own digital um, offerings. Thank, thank you. I mean, we, we've talk, been talking about human and digital for some time and people say, well, what, what does that mean? And, and I do think it's this blend of how can you leverage technology but also ensure that you give a personal people touch because I think the the pandemic has demonstrated over the last couple of years of how we can very often forget about people being people and mental wellness. I think that's that's really key. Okay, so let's now have a quick look at talent. So let's let's talk about talent. And talent, I think, is really interesting. I'm gonna and I'm gonna uh, the backdrop on this for me is around the fact that over the last couple of years, the balance between organisations and employees has changed. You know, there's there's been over the years there's been several books about the deal. What's the new organisational deal? And I think we've seen that people have been able to thrive and adapt, and have taken more accountability for where they work and how they work. And I think that's that's really one of the things that we need to think about in terms of mobility. So, um, Selena, can I ask you to just talk about what some of the insights are are, are, are here from what are some of the insights here? Yeah, sure thing. So I think, you know, some of these categories look quite familiar to us. And if you think about that four box grid, when you're looking at the types of assignments you might have, um, yes. I think traditionally, you know, some of these aren't a surprise, like the developing the future leaders, etc. But the ones that stand out to me are, um, first of all, about the one well, at the end, the 26 percent um, motivation for the assignment being to provide continued employment, either to the employee or the partner. And I think that's been quite a significant increase on prior years. And obviously, the pandemic is playing a part here, I think, where we've had to redeploy people due to them not being able to remain where they're located or some complication um, or trying to keep families so they're not separated. So that's obviously gone up quite, um, quite astronomically. The other piece that disappoints me is the enhancing DE&I because 8%, you know, okay, it's good to see, but, you know, I think it is, you know, a massive priority of ESG and perhaps we'd expect that to be a little bit higher, to be honest with you. Um, so those would be my key observations. Thank you. Good. Okay. So I'm going to ask Peter to sort of walk us through what's been going on here. Um, quite a lot, I think, is is is, is the, the short answer. The, the, long, the longer answer is clearly that the pandemic has, has created a, a series of, of shifts um, from um governments mandating that people work at home so keeping them out of the offices and keeping them away from sort of congregating um 
one of the things that that has then led to is people sort of saying, well, I've got two homes. One of them is in, in this country and another one is, is somewhere sunnier. So I'm going to head off there and I'm going to work from there. And, and you know, if you can work from a desk in your home in, in one country, why can't you work from a desk in your home in another country? So that's certainly one of the things that I know Dino and myself particularly have been working with clients on together with you, John, uh, quite a lot over the last year and a half, because it's not a simple thing. Um, in, in just going and working somewhere else because there are a range of compliance issues that we can come to a little, maybe a little bit later that um, that impact this for companies and I think organizations are, are looking at this quite quite closely. That being said, um, you know some organizations um, have been doing mobile working for 10, 15 years. Um, so it's not necessarily a new thing and I think the, the, the advances in technology have made it um, easier and made it possible, but it brings, as I've said, a range of compliance issues and it, and it brings um, brings a range of sort of duty of care uh, for our employees types of issues as well and um, particularly for um, maybe more more uh, people who work at more of a team and not being actually together physically together with that team um, can be challenging and, and the younger people who might not be used to this having to get used to be in a flat on their own maybe working um, can cause quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of challenges. So it's it's um, I think it's something that's still mutating um, a bit like the virus, um, and we're going to see a change. We've seen some countries, and this is the point I'll finish on, John. I think we've seen some countries, um, Estonia, Croatia, um, somewhere in the Caribbean is another one where where they've been. Um, the governments have been issuing. Um, nomadic type of visas um, for people so they've encouraged people to come and work in their countries remote you know remotely from, from where they're based as governments start to realize what's happening here if you like um i think they're going to take much more interest in this and i think we're going to see new rules and regulations develop over over the next few years i mean governments never respond to these things instantly if they're not high on their priority list but i think they'll get to this eventually and they'll start to introduce regulations that might restrict people a little bit more than they currently are Thank you, Peter. Uh, Bino, we're going to uh, c- conscious of time, but any any insights for you? Yeah, I mean, t- t- just a quick one. I think I'm seeing on on the D- the DNI point, the um, diversity point that Selena made. Um, um, you know, we're we're used to seeing commuter assignments, right? Where where you want to get a different type of person to get international experience. Perhaps it doesn't work from a family perspective, but you want to make that work. And in this short term, I've seen organisations turn to virtual assignments. Uh, it's not the same, absolutely not, but allowing someone that has a family that can't relocate or it's not the right time to work work virtually on a role in another country gives you the ability to tap into that wider pool of talent. Um, so it's something I've seen organisations um, doing in a purposeful way. Thank you. And, and just to pick up, I want, to, I want to reinforce what Selena was saying, that I do think it's interesting that this whole cultural, diver- cultural and gender diversity seems to have taking a back seat a little bit. And I think that what you know, while whilst organizations see that as a major initiative, mobility teams need to be thinking about what can they do to influence that within their program. I think that was the point you were making, Selena, wasn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. So Julia, tell us about what's been happening with the trends around what 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 are the expectations, the types of movements over the next couple of years, do you think? Um, well, this is a encouraging picture for those of us in the global mobility industry. Um, so the, the top line there, that purple line, is the, the remote or virtual arrangements. So we can see that actually the, the prevalence of those, while still very high, um, it, it's not expected to increase particularly um, well, not as much as the more traditional assignment types. So, as we said, getting more into that sort of hybrid working arrangements. But it's um, it seems that virtual assignments have kind of hit their peak as far as effectiveness and um, and the way that mobility is going to go. So, so what we're what we're seeing in this picture is significant growth, in fact, expected in the more traditional assignments um, and also graduate programs. So we've got graduate programs um, increasing quite significantly, like 28 percent. Um, one way international relocations, employee initiated. So again, that um, much more duty of care and allowing employee choice. Um, and we're not seeing um, that 
um, that physical mobility is, is really going to slow down. But perhaps this um, quite sharp increase in all of these mobility types is some pent up demand. So it would be interesting to see what actually happens over 2022. But it, it does still seem that um, the value of physical relocations is still considered a fundamental tool for business success and talent development. Um, the demand for talent is still there with um, that one way international relocations company initiated. So there's still you know, the, the need to source talent globally and actually have them physically move to the location of where that work is on a more permanent basis. So I think um, one of the other parts though is, is we can see the at the bottom that bottom line international business travelers where of course through 2020 was practically zero or below zero <laughs> the, the growth has, is going right up um, quite significantly so um, so I think what we're seeing here is that and certainly from interviews I conducted for this survey uh, physical mobility is still considered a very important part of business thank you and Peter I know you're going to talk about business travellers a little bit later on, but any quick insights on, on you know, this? I think, I think, come back. Yeah, I, I think the one thing I just 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 sort of to build on on what Julius just said um, is that you know I think we're certainly seeing an awful lot more movements um, now than in the past from east to west, if you like. So I think there has been a traditionally a move where, where people are moving out of of, of developed Western countries. Um, into other parts of the world, we're seeing a huge number of people coming now from uh, from um, the east into into the rest of the world, and 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 they're very strong on company culture. And, and we're seeing one of the one of the things I see very regularly with these organisations is that they they almost have to have 10% of people from the home country in every new location that they open up because that's how they advance and and keep their culture strong around the world. So so that's one of the trends we're seeing. Uh, I've been seeing in the last few years that's only growing at okay. the moment so i think okay. an interesting one interesting well, we'll come back we'll move back on to that when we when we get to that section so sorry john just one other point sorry if i don't mind, you don't mind me off saying um, they're talking at the moment about the big resignation aren't they you know not just the uk yeah. but globally and i think there's a lot yeah. of talk now about international assignments being that talent retention tool like really accelerating that to make sure that they don't lose their top talents that's something to ponder on too to really like talk to leaders and say, look, this is a way of us keeping our people mm. inside and not being lost to the competition or walking out the front door. Absolutely. And just to say, it's interesting, I interviewed an HR director for the survey about two or three years ago, and, and he was saying that, you know, people now are have the ability, if, if you have the right digital uh, and technical skills, professional skills, you own your, your own career as ever more so than before, wherever people would be wedded to organizations for many, many years, people now realize that they have a, a portfolio of skills. And I think ret retaining the right people through different experiences will be critical. So I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Julia, maybe you can just talk about Colflex and how that, we, we talked about employee experience and choice. Well, how does that play out, do you think? Um, well, I guess the um, Coreflex is is here with us as a, I think it has been used as a tool to give employees more choice, but actually the predominant trend remains that it's for organisations to mandate some core um, parts of the policy, which are critical for either compliance or employee duty of care and then extending optional benefits rather than giving cash or a lump sum or a points-based system. So those optional benefits are really for the um, business or global mobility or HR to make that decision and in, in some cases for the employee to make decisions around the flexible benefits. Um, the second most common approach is um, a points-based system, which is more complex to set up, but once you have it in place, it can work quite well. And then um, lump sum cash, as you can see at the end, is less common. Um, and I think you know, I'm, I'm having various conversations with some clients around lump sum approaches, but it does very much put the responsibility with the employee, and that does relinquish some of your duty of care. So. I guess the challenge remains is how to manage exceptions um, in a way that doesn't dilute the employee experience. So having that duty of care and cost benefits 
and also being clear on the the, the level of administration and support that is required to give the right support to an employee or to the business in selecting the flexible benefits. Again, technology is critical in, um, in managing a core flex program and uh, yeah. making sure that you can actually track and understand what's being used and why, particularly that will help feed into your strategic workforce planning and profiles and uh, again informing um, that using the data around those flexible choices which is not as straightforward as general policy um, take up and exception tracking. Uh, absolutely thank you thank you for that Julia. Selena as a user as a professional you know a leader of a mobility function what's your take on yeah, I think um, you know, being really I'm not looking for advocacy or yeah, or, no, no, know, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think you know, core flex it can mean different things to different organisations, and I think Julie's spot on with the comment about the pandemic and like the duty of care aspect. So I think many organisations are definitely reevaluating, you know, to what level can individuals, you know, trade down um, if there's a risk associated with that. Um, I think also there's a lot of startups and scale up organizations that are you know looking to kind of switch the levers a lot. So I think there's a lot of segmentation now of policies. Um, the other aspect is looking at ESG because I know that organizations as well are looking at you know how do they address sustainability of assignments. I know we'll probably maybe talk about it later, but that almost becomes a core flex. You know, in the future, will individual signees be able to, you know, actually switch around things you know to, to have more of a carbon zero assignment so there's lots of potential with this you know and i think lots of tinkering that that is happening and will happen in the future so just be really clear with your organization about what it means for your company what are your objectives what's core what's not and clear communication and technology to enable it to happen is really the critical aspect good okay I and mean, we could probably have a whole session on this but yeah. we're, we're not but, but but thanks for your insights both of you Okay, so now let's have a look at risk. So we've talked about, let's just, where have we been? We've talked about transformation of mobility, how uh, the roles have changed. We've talked about talent where there's much more, much more of a continuum and we're trying to see where it's going to move to. And now I think what we're going to look at is what are some of the risk implications for organisations? Because we're in a very fluid, uncertain world and um, where people start to want to make more personal choices, they may all they may not always be aligned with the needs and the rules of government. So, Selena, may I ask you to carry on talking about this uncertainty because it clearly, you know, we just had in in the in the UK, we just had another you know instruction that we have to wear masks when we go in, into shops and other measures that need to be kicked in, and it's the same around the world. There's this rolling you know whilst we've had the pandemic it's not over we haven't drawn a line in the sand and it's going to be rolling so so what does it mean do you think for mobility team selena yeah i think our role has really expanded here so in the past i think we used to have a nice to have conversation with you know the people who are responsible for the international sos you know relationships we we might think around and look at some of the other risk aspects but now it really is a fundamental part of our DNA. We have to be, make sure that our community is safe and secure and the health is being managed. So I think our remit has really blown blown up here and expanded. And, you know, um, the things that come to mind are, you know, talking to your organisation about do we have like global life assurance? You know, have we actually looked at that fully? You know, what is our expat private medical scheme doing? Have we actually got one? Um, you know, does it cover aspects of COVID? Um, there's so many different aspects. It's having that whole risk management assessment and, you know, look at the risk register for the assignments and the projects you're doing to make sure that every aspect is covered. And do you have relationships with the people around your organization that are stakeholders um, in this area and, and really become best friends with them? Because when a crisis happens now, we need to make sure there's contingency planning. Because I think part of the survey we established in the, that, like I think it was 99% of organizations felt that they didn't have the right contingency planning in place for the pandemic and i'd like to think if we reassess yeah. that in a year's time it would be weighted the other direction and i think you know all of us should walk away and think okay if i haven't done it already for 2022 i'm going to get that established i'm going to regularly review it in line with the regulations changing um, i won't touch on immigration i know peter will be uh, 
desperate to enlighten us on that aspect but i mean that's a headache in itself isn't it and so, yeah peter was so mm -hmm. in and we'll, then we'll feed into talking about business travel but tell, tell me a bit about what are some of the things that have happened and what do people need to be thinking about do you think well, I mean, I, th I think several, several several things have happened, but but before I go into that, I just wanted to pick up something Selena mentioned a few moments ago, which was about what governments are now doing, and I, and I think this is really important to understand, you know, how governments are now trying to enforce compliance. Governments now get information from travel travel management companies, from airlines, from shipping companies about people when they book their trips, so they can see in advance that people are heading their way. Um, so that's that's a capability they never had before. They've got technology that allows them to deep dive into into large amounts of data, big data, <clears throat> um, to do analysis. So their ability to spot potential non-compliance has has been enhanced um, significantly. So that's 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 the first thing. Second thing now, some of this has been done structurally. Um, for instance, the creation of the Homeland Security Department in the United States, or a similar Customs and Borders organisation in the UK and Australia and various other parts of the world. So that, that's happening. But where it's not being done structurally, it is being done in reality with with organisations who have a, 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 if you like, a responsibility for people who cross the border, whether that be um, customs, uh, tax, uh, immigration, whether it be health, all of these people now work much more closely together um, and share data together. And we've seen regular and laws change around the world to enable government departments to, to exchange data properly with each other. So they're much more effective in, in, in being joined up. So first question, in your own organisations, do you have a single view of the data about who your travellers are. I mean, I know past surveys have said to us that that's not always the case, and there's a compliance risk there in itself in, in different bits of your organisation using different different data. So when we talk about data quality, one of the areas that's really important in this area is that every bit of the organisation is using the same version of the truth. Um, the second thing then, you asked about things that have happened, John. Well, clearly uh, a number of things. COVID has happened, so com countries have been using um, immigration laws to um, to bring about changes. So um, we now have to do certain things, you know, to sh show we've been vaccinated, to show we've got uh, a test. All of these types of things have, have been largely brought in under immigration rules in, 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 in many places. So this has become an important part of, you know, what, what, what countries are looking at now. And again, you know, are they looking at that in advance? Maybe uh, in, in some cases. Um, so immigration has had that to deal with. It's also had to deal with, say, something like Brexit, where uh, in Europe at least, um, British nationals are no longer part of the EU, and so they're subject to a different set of um, of rules. And in the business travel space, I think this has become a potentially big issue because a lot of business travellers don't reckon that the changes affect them. And maybe for a short period of time they won't, but ultimately, um, particularly with what I've said about the government's ability to collect data, it will be obvious wow. how, how much time they're spending there, and that, that'll be an issue for them. So, without further ado, let, let, let's have a look at, if you want to give us maybe, uh, uh, Peter, I can ask you to kick off, and then Dino, give us a couple mm -hmm. of insights. Just give us the really hit the headlines of what you think is going on now with business travel, because it's, it's changing, right? It's becoming even more... Um, challenging because because governments are looking at it more closely right well well people are looking at it more closely and, and some of that's been brought about by by employers exercising their duty of care they're trying to look after the welfare of their people so for instance we're seeing a lot of companies saying well no non-essential travel no internal travel they're meeting they're traveling for internal meetings so they're cutting that out at the same time you know we've got clients who throughout the pandemic have been probably they, they would tell us you know somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent of the normal travel because they're they're often having to service contracts in other countries and they're having sent people from one place to the other and because they're contracted to do that and they're contracted to service equipment maintain equipment uh, fix equipment that type of thing so, so business travel hasn't stopped but it, it certainly slowed down a lot but there, there, there have been you know that's been going on with the, with the COVID background so I, I think companies are certainly taking much more of an interest in it and because of the duty of care piece I think one of the things we saw we, we held a face-to-face -face session with some clients in London a, a few months back uh, which was really nice to see people face to face again um, but one of the things came out of that was that you know HR people saying we're getting much more involved in business travel than we ever have before because 
the importance of duty of care has risen right up the agenda because of COVID. Um, and so now we're getting involved where we haven't been before, where, where business travel has been something that somebody else often does. So it's been quite an interesting dynamic that. Thank you. My, my, just to say my read on this is also that maybe the business is more bullish about moving people around, whereas mobility, quite rightly, I understand the implications of risk. And Dino, maybe that's the issue, right? Yeah, I think I think I think on business travel, um, probably a couple couple of quick points. One is around purpose, and the, and the other one is around ESG. So I, so we're we're seeing certainly in my own family, um, business travel is resumed, and it's resuming for good purpose. And the purposes seem to be things like, we have had new joiners around the world, we haven't brought them together, we need to do team building again because we've let that take a back seat. So the the reason for travel is changing. It's becoming more about development and bringing people together. And then on the ESG point, I, I think um, if, if you are going from London to Amsterdam once a week, right, over five weeks for a project, the question has to be, why are you not going for a five-day trip? If you compare the CO2 emissions, um, obviously there, there's a big difference. So I, th I, think, I think that will change some behaviours as well. So how do you do business travel in a way that's slightly different, which actually, to Peter's point, maybe presents more immigration risk um, uh, as well. Yeah. Those are my quick thoughts. So just keeping with you, and Peter and, and, and Dino, you know, I know one of the things that you're talking, I mean, it's interesting, Selena talks about 91% had weren't ready for this. You know, going forwards, it needs to be the other way around, only 9% who aren't. What, what are some of the headlines that people need to be thinking about from, you know, learning from the past and what, what, what tools can help them? Peter? I think just just to yeah so um i mean there are tools out there to help people but it's not just about you know technology here it is about um proper alignment across an organization so if you looked at business travel as a as a particular topic area how many different departments in your organization have to deal with an element of business travel um yes. you know you have the tax piece and that the tax piece is normally i think dina will agree we've spoken about this before is normally done after the trip Things like immigration, things like the, the, the sort of COVID regulations, they all have to be to be checked and enforced before the trip actually takes place. But again, are different people doing those different activities? And back to my earlier point, are they using the same data? Is the organization aligned about exactly what it wants to do? Um, and that's, an, that's sometimes easier said than done. Um, you know, you might have a, an organization that's trying to restrict certain types of meetings, maybe limit the, the, the travel by some of their sales marketing people. Um, but equally, they've got their 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 um, you know their their mechanical division who have to just send people at at, at the trick of a of a button almost from the from the client. They say if something's broken, you need to send somebody to fix it. So, um, understanding how you manage all of that in an organisation, you know, technology can help, but on its own, it it, it it's not enough. I think I think you need to get that proper alignment and and have somebody driving it. And again, you know, do companies have a single person or, or group of people who are responsible overall for business travel. We're not seeing an awful lot of that at the moment. Okay. Dino, any other insights or we move on? No, just uh, just on, on, a, on, a, on crisis management, I, I, th I think everyone has a blueprint, right? They've just developed one. If, if they haven't, um, that's, that would be confusing. So it's about not letting that blueprint just gather dust. It has to evolve, right, over time. I think we're being challenged, like just this week's news, on Omricom is challenging us. So, so it's really it's about understanding. Um, so, for example, most organisations can run a report through their um, IT system to tell you where people are logging in from, IP addresses around the world. Is that okay? Is that desirable? You know, it, it's that kind of thing around technology and improving that crisis management plan that I think is going to be a key focus. And this is not just global mobility. This is an organisational challenge. And 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 it's and there's the nine percent. And I think, as you said, I think um, Selena, if I can ask you to maybe just talk to us about what some of the challenge you know, compliance challenges are. Sure thing. So I think you know, definitely. I mean, the number one one which uh, Dino would talk about is uh, you know the, the kind of compliance side. I mean, the fact that there's a rising cost, you know, and of course we can understand why. There's all these extra checks and balances that have to be done. And then you've got like the complexity of process. So I think we really do need to evaluate, you know, what we're doing, how we're doing it, and also what the operating model looks like. You know, should we, you know, keep this stuff in house? You know, is outsourcing a more efficient route? Looking at the right partners, etc. And I think 
that whole piece about stakeholder management. I mean, the relationship with comms is really essential and I've always lent on them heavily to make sure not just the messages get out, but they're received in the right way and that people react and respond. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot we have to evaluate about how we're doing things um, because we're really strained. We've got so much on our plate. We need to be savvy um, and also really evolve, you know, how that how we're actually running the program, given the context we find ourselves in. Yes. Julia, any other insights on that? Yeah, I think um, you know, we have to accept that compliance is going to be um, more tricky and process is more tricky now in the in the new new world, new types of mobility, um, and that stakeholder management is really critical. But part of that stakeholder management is actually getting them to understand that the cost of mobility increases with that complexity. So what um, was a fairly straightforward compliance activity is now taking longer, whether it's done in-house or externally. And there are more compliance things to consider, more complex process, more planning. And with that has to come a cost. And so business needs to understand that mobility is most, most likely going to be more expensive than it was two years ago. Which, which is why at the beginning it said about mobility focusing more on managing compliance suppliers to make sure they manage the costs and contain it, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, Dino, um, we've we got about 10 minutes left, so I'd like to get to the end and see if we have some questions, but let me just ask you for a couple of uh, thoughts on innovation. Yeah, I, th I think the way I look at this is, we started, didn't we, at the beginning saying mobility, um, is now well known. It's under the microscope. It's it's got a seat at the table. It's more visible. Uh, you you've talked to business leaders um, and asked them what is it they're looking for, right? In effect, and I guess what we have in this slide is an invitation to global mobility and HR people. And the invitation is saying, um, tell me about data. Tell me about how we use social media. Tell me about cost management, cost visibility, cost reporting. Um, you know, tell me about all of that stuff. Tell me about how you engage better with the business uh, and and stakeholders within it. So, so, so I think I think the way to process this, and that's you know a third, a third, and there's others on there as well. But it's here on this slide are invitations for mobility and HR leaders to engage with the business and their leaders. So, so my question back to everyone is, how will you do this? Um, are you doing an annual report? Is your annual review summary between you and your boss enough? Does that give you enough stakeholder engagement? So are you looking at business unit or line of business reports or presentations? So I think a lot of this is going to become more and more critical. And remember, the opportunity is there. You're more visible. The invitation is there to do more in these areas. So it's about how. That would be my key point. So it, you're saying it's an invitation to innovate. Yeah, absolutely. Right, invitation to innovation. I like that. That's a, our marketing team will like that. <laughs> so, I was going to do the summary, but Julia, can I ask you just to maybe just wrap up some of the things we've been talking about here? It, last ten years, it's it's been an interesting journey, hasn't it? Last ten years. It has. <laughs> it has. I think. Um... What, what we see here is a, a summary of, of various statistics throughout the survey um, and really shows that it's um, the priorities for global mobility have um, have evolved and will continue to evolve. So I think um, the evolution over the last 10 years has has been slowly happening, but the, the prior sort of 18 months to two years has accelerated that. So whilst there has been transformation, I think um, you know, we always talk that everything is quite cyclical in global mobility, but I, I think what we're seeing here is that some of these changes are here to stay. We won't go back to some of the old ways of working. Um, we are going to be much more digital. There is going to be um, sort of more focus on compliance and more focus on, I guess, planning and, and strategic um, planning of global mobility. We've got to have um, global mobility's 
um, profile now that it's risen up the chain they're going to have to take control they're going to have to have a a new look I suppose and um, and really embrace this um, this rapid evolution and and continue to add value embrace digital embrace data and as Dino said I guess it's an invitation to to innovate and, um, and continue on with that transformation but I think there needs to be a settling in period with um, the rapid changes that have happened over the past two years so global mobility can kind of wrap their arms around it and really understand what how they add value to the business what's critical and um, and what their next steps will be. Thank you and I, and I think all that if you speak to many mobility people it's all it's taken a lot of energy and it, you can see that people feel they, you know, very exhausted with the with the journey, but but in many cases it's exciting and and it's it's you know we're at the cusp, really at the cusp of, of an evolution of how we do things in this in this industry, which I think is really exciting. So thank you for that, Julia. So I said at the beginning we were going to talk about um, about what are the priorities for mobility. You know, what's the how does how does the organisation use mobility? And how do you define mobility? You know, Dino talked about the fact it was, you know, a global workforce and I could choose to go and work somewhere and Julia may not know where I am. Am I doing my job? Probably I am. Am I compliant? Maybe I'm not. What does that mean for the role of mobility? What is it you, we need to be doing differently? You know, you, if you can't have an increased headcount, you can't be all things to all people. So what are the priorities? We talked with Peter and Selena and, and Dino about some of the compliance opportunities. And it's about thinking about how do you leverage data? How do I access the data and how do I make that meaningful? And then in terms of ESG, as, as Selena was saying, you know, we need to start rethinking about the, the whole continuum of ways in which we can be more innovative. And last but not least, you know, what does it mean for how you partner with your external supply chain? What is it they can be doing? What are your expectations from them? So, on that, I'd like to thank you for, for listening in to the webinar. We've spookily for once got seven minutes left, six or seven minutes left. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, John, we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, does uh, diversity and inclusion and employee well-being sit under, under the employee experience? I'm gonna ask um, Selena to answer that. I think it, would sit, it could sit in both areas. I think it could sit within the corporate strategy and then also within the employee experience. So I think, you know, it's a 360 degree lens, isn't it? So it has to be sold. It has to be addressing, you know, ultimately what the investors are looking for because investors don't want to be involved with a company that hasn't got an excellent de &I structure. So they have to be singing and dancing it and showing that they really take it seriously. But then equally, um, you know, particularly the younger generation won't join an organisation unless they're really convinced on aspects of ESG. So I think it has to be addressed through corporate and also through, you know, how it's communicated on the intranet site, you know, is it being like lived and breathed in day-to-day -day operations? I think that in terms of DE and I, and I think in terms of employee well-being, absolutely. So again, I think you know, the corporate needs to put in the right infrastructure, they need to put in the right support mechanisms, but it has to also be, you know, the experience. I mean, well-being again, it's one of those aspects that is like absolutely um you know mandatory now you know to not only for the the employees but also for you know the assignees and their dependents and i think investment in those areas will have to keep increasing to make sure that you know people don't burn out so i, I think absolutely that's one aspect and the corporate side is also very very critical to get the right investments and the right buy-in from above thank you Sia. the um serge what other questions do we have We've got one more, qu more question, which is, how would you tackle the uh, PE? I think it's a permanent establishment risk that could arise from remote working. You know, that must be got your name on it, I think. I, th I, think, I think it has, yeah. Um, it's, it's really a case of being very methodical. So not all cases of, of, of uh, cross-border remote working will cause PE issues, but they could. Um, so it's really about collecting the right information, analysing that information, and then look, look, and putting that in the context of your corporate structure. And, and then what I do is 
establish are there changes you can make to that arrangement which make a PE less likely? Um, I don't think it's always possible to remove risk altogether, but what you can do is, is sometimes alter the arrangement through duties or sign off rights and make it less likely. But my, my top tip there really is, is structure. You have to analyze these cases with structure. Because Dino, you could have a, an entity in a, in, a, in a country and have somebody then working there doing duties which are outside of the scope Abs of absolutely. that yeah. right? And that so, creates an UPE risk. Absolutely. So have, having an entity that is unrelated to someone's duties doesn't help you manage your PE risk. But as people think, oh, well, we've got a company there, that's okay, we're fine. And then, then they're in trouble. Yeah, it's not as simple as that, as you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody else want to ask any questions? Any more for any more? You, do, you don't often get access to a tax partner for free, so ask as many questions as you like. <laughs> <laughs> Meet just run in. <laughs> no, <I don't> <laughs> Anything else I can see? Is there a question coming in? Uh, there are no more questions coming in, John. Okay. Well, let's just say then. So, thank you for for joining us today. I hope that you've enjoyed it. We're here. We're not going away. We'd love to uh, to talk to you and get your thoughts and insights. And just to say that obviously in the appendix, there are people like myself who love to go into the detail and you have the full data sets in the back. Thank you for joining us for the webinar. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. So on behalf of Santa Fe Relocation and Crow, and also for Selena, thank you so much today for your time um, and, and interest in this webinar. Thank you. And wherever you are in the world, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.